Okay, welcome tonight to our summer sessions. This is uh, the last of a series, and so welcome everybody. And why don't we begin uh, by reciting the glory be all together, okay? Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Okay, so tonight, uh, as advertised, we're going to talk about Blessed Pierre Giorgio Frassati. How many of you have heard of him before? Okay, how many of you have never heard of him before? Oh, good, you've come to the right place. This is great. Okay, so what we want to do is kind of introduce him to you tonight. This picture you see here is probably uh, the most famous picture of him. He was 16 years old in this picture. But We'll talk more about that later. But first, I want to carry on from where Ethan left off. Remember, he talked about Dorothy Day. Now, we, the name of my talk is uh, um, Blessed Pierre Giorgio Frassati, Hero of the Beatitudes. Uh, he was a man of the Beatitudes. John Paul II referred to him as the man of the Beatitudes, okay? Well, Dorothy Day was also a woman of the Beatitudes, wasn't she? And she tried to make the Beatitudes her guiding principle. And she said, here's a quote from her, What are we trying to do? We are trying to get to heaven, all of us. We are trying to lead a good life. We are trying to talk about and write about the Sermon on the Mount, the Beatitudes, the social principles of the church. And it is most astounding the things that happen when you start trying to live this way. So this is like one of my favorite Dorothy Day quotes. I mean, she says, when you try to live this way, it's astounding the things that happen. And her life showed that. And also we're going to find that Pierre Giorgio Frassati's life showed that as well. Now, Dorothy Day was already three and a half years old by the time Pierre Giorgio Frassati was born. So I just tell you that to put it in sort of a historical perspective, because we've all heard of Dorothy Day, at least if you came to hear Ethan's talk, you've heard of Dorothy Day, and we really feel like we can relate to her. She's a very, uh, very modern-day saint, a saint for our times, right? Because she lived up until 1980. How many of you remember 1980? Most of you, but some, some of you do not remember it. I remember it well. And, uh, and uh, to think that Dorothy Day lived up until then. So those of us who were alive, Michelle, you and me, you were a baby, and I wasn't much older than you, was I? Uh, we are what you would call contemporaries with Dorothy Day because we lived the same time she did. So we have that relationship with her. So we're going to uh, connect ourselves to Pierre Giorgio Frassati now because he lived when Dorothy Day was alive, okay? So this is how we're going to segue into this talk on Frassati. Okay, so just a little bit of information about him. You have uh, on your handout, it has this information. His name was actually... Pierre Giorgio Michelangelo Frassati. That's a great name, isn't it? And he was born in 1901. I always remember that because my grandpa was born in 1901. So I have another connection with Pierre Giorgio, right? Well, he did die in 1925, and so that tells you he wasn't very old when he died. And, and yeah, and we'll talk about that. He was beatified by Pope John Paul II in 1990, so that wasn't very long ago. And he is buried in the Cathedral of St. John the Baptist in Turin, Italy. Torino, as they say in Italy, right? Okay, so who knows what else is in the Cathedral of John the Baptist in Turin, Italy? Yes, the Shroud, the famous Shroud of Turin. Okay, how many of you have been there and seen any of this? Okay, 
after our little talk tonight, I'm sure you're going to want to go. Okay. So, uh, Pierre Giorgio Frassati is a saint for the modern world, and, and, hang on, my notes are sticking together here. And especially for young people, now born in uh, 1901 in Turin, Pierre Giorgio was a model of virtue, a man of the Beatitudes, as Pope John Paul II called him at, the, at his beatification in 1990. And he was described by friends as an explosion of joy. Okay, now I also gave you on that sheet some references because there's no way in 45 minutes we're going to be able to uh, talk about everything about Pierre Giorgio. So I want to share with you some places that you can go to get more information. Uh, back in the 90s, uh, there was an organization that sprung up here in the States called Frasati USA. And a real devotion to Blessed Pierre Giorgio after his beatification rose up in America and actually all around the world. And in, here in the States, they came up with this campaign, sort of, get to know him, they would say. And they put out all kinds of videos and all kinds of stuff. And so if you go on to YouTube... Uh, and you Google Frasati, get to know him. This really great uh, video that they put together shows up, and I recommend that you watch that, okay? So Frasati, get to know him. That's put out by Frasati USA. That's frasatiusa.org. I put it out on your sheet there, but that's how you can look it up. And there is just a whole bunch of information there. So just about everything I'm going to mention tonight, you can find on that website. Also, we are fortunate to be able to um, log into a ministry called Formed, which is part of the Augustine Institute. And you'll see that I've put Formed on there, and there is some handouts as well about Formed and what's going to be on Formed in September, so you can see what the latest is. And also, I put some envelopes there, because what we're going to start doing is collecting money to pay for the new uh, renewal of the form, because it costs us almost $2,000 every year to have access to Formed, and a lot of people don't know that. Well, we want to share that with you, because, well, times being what they are and all. Okay, so there's an envelope so you can participate. Now, on Formed, you can let, look at these two resources. One by uh, Father Tim Dieter. It's an audio file. You can listen to it, and he gives a talk. And he does, probably does a much better job than I do because he's just crazy about Blessed Pierre Giorgio, and he gives this great, entertaining talk. So I encourage you to listen to that. Also, there is an e-book available there, which you can download onto your e-reader or even onto your computer if you don't mind reading a whole book on your computer. Uh, but if you have an e-reader like a Nook or a Kindle or something, very easy to read, very nicely done. This book written by Christina Sicardi, who is an Italian author, and she's done a lot of research about uh, Blessed Frassati, and she actually has written a lot of articles all over the place. Uh, you can find out about her, too. But really nicely done, this book. Also, this is a book that you can get at Holy Family Bookstore or at the bookstore up at Mount Angel, or you can order it from Ignatius Press or Amazon.com. Okay, this book is actually written by Pierre Giorgio's sister, uh, Lu Luciana, um, really good. She talks about, you know, their childhood and everything, so I highly recommend that. Okay, so now you know where to get more information. Okay, blessed Pierre Giorgio had parents, right? And growing up in Italy, you would expect his parents to be good and Catholic, right? Here is his father, Alfredo Frassati, and his mother, her name was Adelaide, her maiden name, Amethyst, and they got married. Uh, they did have a child before Pierre Giorgio, but she died in infancy, and uh, so Pierre was, their, was then the, um, their next child, and then after that, Luciana, right? And um, 
The thing about the, his parents, they were very wealthy, uh, very talented, and Mr. Frassati was the uh, proprietor of La Stampa, which is a newspaper. It's still around in Turin. It's a very popular newspaper, and you can actually go online and read it. It's all in Italian, but it's kind of fun because Italian's fun to read. I have no idea what they're saying, but it uh, uh, makes you feel like you're there and part of things. However, it's not his newspaper anymore. Another family owns it, and I'll talk about that, how it fell out of their hands. But anyway, um, so Mr. Frassati, he was, he was the newspaper publisher, and his mother, Adelaide, she was an artist. And she uh, was trained by some brilliant artists at their home up in uh, north of Turin, where she's from, about 80 kilometers north. And um, anyway, I'll show you a picture of their house and all that kind of stuff later. But anyway, here's baby Pierre Giorgio, right? And they uh, called him Pierre Giorgio. That's like his first name. You would never call him Pierre. Sometimes he's called Pietro Giorgio, from what I can tell from reading stuff. And uh, also, they never called him Michelangelo, even though that was his middle name. I guess in Italian they say Michelangelo or something or other. But uh, some of his friends called him Giorgio, though. But that's kind of like short, you know. His name is Pierre and Giorgio, and they call him Giorgio sometimes. Um, but... Uh, Sometimes he's called Frassati. So you can call him Blessed Frassati. You can call him Pierre Giorgio or Blessed Pierre Giorgio or uh, Pierre Giorgio Frassati or, if you're daring, Giorgio. But nobody's going to know who you're talking about if you say Giorgio. That's just what I've come to find out from talking to all these different people. Okay, so anyway, he was his father's only son. And, of course, his father expected that he would grow up and take over as editor of the family business, the newspaper La Stampa. Uh, I think in this picture, uh, Pier Giorgio is about 13 years old. And here he is, about the same age, from what I can gather. This was his first communion photo. Okay, first communion, first holy communion. Oh, isn't that nice? Okay, this is the home up north. Um, What's the name of that town? It is... Oh, I didn't write it in my notes. Anyway, trust me, go eight north on the highway 80 miles and there you are. Anyway, this was, this was their, became their summer home. And uh, their, their home in Turin was much bigger. These were rich people. I mean, I mean they, they had a lot of money. They had servants and everything. So. What I mean to say is, Pierre Giorgio was born into privilege, okay? In those days, you could be born into privilege, right? Rich people, when they would walk down the street, they would walk down quickly because you didn't look left to right because there's poor people, and you're, you don't want to acknowledge them, right? Because you're the rich people. That's how things were back in uh, the turn of the century. Remember when we used to refer to 1900 as the turn of the century, right? Uh, does anyone ever refer to 2000 as the turn of the century? I think we should start doing that. Otherwise, we're going to start feeling old. Okay. So, Alfredo, uh, here he is with his son. You can tell, look in this picture. He's looking at him like, I have big plans for you. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I'm looking at my notes, which has pictures on them as well. Okay, he's looking at his son, and he's like, son, I have big plans for you. You're going to take over the newspaper. And... Uh, as far as I can tell, Pierre Giorgio had no aspirations to do any such thing. Um, in fact, even at a young age, he was, he was very much concerned about other people, poor people, and which you can imagine was common in those days because people didn't have like food stamps and they didn't have um, um, any kind of benefit probably back in 1910 or whatever year this was, maybe 1915, and uh, people would come and knock on the door and uh, beg for food, beg or ask for some money. And if Pierre Giorgio would answer the door according to some of the stories told by his sister, he would say, hold on just a minute, my dad will find some work for you and my mother will give you some money, right? 
And, but if his dad came to the door, he'd answer the door and he says, ah, get out of here, you smell like alcohol. And he'd slam the door on him. And then Pierre Giorgio would cry and he would say, mama, mama, papa, sending them away. He's hungry. We have to make some food for him and all this kind of stuff. So this, is, this was uh, the heart that little Pierre Giorgio had in those days. And, uh, but his dad, of course, wanted him to become the newspaper tycoon. But what's interesting is Pierre Giorgio was not that great of a student, and he failed Latin. And even though he, he and his sister, he was uh, 17 months older than his sister, but uh, they w were kept at home and tutored until they were about um, uh, probably eight years old or something. And then they went to what they call the gymnasium, which we would call primary school. Does that make sense? Okay. And so they were kind of kept in the same grade. But um, Luciana would pass up Pierre Giorgio, and she d was a better student than him. Oh, she was just brilliant. We'll tell you more about her in a bit. But uh, here's the whole family together. Uh, Pierre, eventually Pierre Giorgio fell further behind and he, uh, after he failed Latin and stuff, they took him out of school and put him into a Catholic Jesuit school, hoping that the Jesuits would sort him out. Well, evidently they did because uh, he just grew in his spirituality, even from a very young age. So, uh, they were this nice little family, uh, very wealthy, and um, the mother painted, and the father ran the newspaper. Now, a lot happened uh, when Pierre Giorgio was quite young. His father, who uh, was the publisher of La Stampa, also became a very influ influential senator in the kingdom. Italy was a kingdom then, and in 1913... Mr. Frassati became a senator, and then by 1920, he was sent to uh, Berlin. He was the Italian ambassador to Berlin. Uh, Germany was kind of different pieces, and so I guess Berlin got its own ambassador. So I'm not quite sure how it worked. But what's interesting about this? All of a sudden, it's 1920, right? What are we missing here? What are we missing yeah, World War I, the Great War, that all happened. Also, um, something we're kind of experiencing now. What else did I... You're right, the Spanish flu, um, 1918. And this was all very real to them there. They seemed to have survived it, the war and, um, uh, and uh, the flu. Now, Italy, like the United States, tried to stay out of World War I. Uh, but eventually they ended up in the war as well. And the young lad, Pierre Giorgio, saw um, soldiers coming back from the war, a lot of them wounded and, you know, all the talk about people dying. And at a very young age, he was a teenager then, but he's quoted as having said something like, I would give my own life in order to bring a stop to all this killing and fighting. And he often said things like that. More, more about that later. Okay, so here, uh, here they are with their father again. And the parents, a little bit more about them, because it's important that you know about them. They, uh, they weren't very religious. There were no religious objects in their home. You would, you would think that an Italian home would have, you know, like icons everywhere and holy water fonts and all that kind of stuff. None of that. You would think that they would pause before meals to say, bless us, O Lord, and these thy gifts. Never any of that kind of thing. Uh, Mr. Frassati never went to church. Sometimes some, some high-level clerics would come to the house, but that was generally to talk about issues. It wasn't a pastoral visit by any means. Mrs. Frassati, she would go to church. Her and her sister would go to church, but, and the children would go with them. But... The children, according to Luciana, who wrote the book about uh, their growing up and her brother, said they never saw their mother receive Holy Communion. So, 
that gives you an idea of this sort of uh, um, secular life that they were living. And their home was maintained this way. Was not what you would consider a Catholic home for a saint in the making, right? We think of uh, St. Teresa of Lisieux, right? Um, and her family, you know, her, her parents have been, they're saints, weren't they uh, canonized, right? Uh, their, their home was so Catholic, and this was certainly not the case with the Frasades. But Luciana and uh, Pierre Giorgio here, I love this picture of them, course they were very close in age and growing up and they were really when they were young they were sheltered their parents didn't let them out much of course they uh, wanted to keep them safe and so they grew up very close now a lot more is going to happen with Pierre Giorgio because from an early age he developed a real spirituality. Perhaps this had something to do with the Jesuits who were educating him. It also could have something to do with the uh, religious sister who was employed to uh, be their tutor or what we would probably call a governess in the home before they went off to primary school. And so this sister, she was a nun, she would take them out into town and different things and what was common in Italy in those days being a very Catholic nation even though probably half the people didn't go to church or were very secular the thing is you were Catholic right you were born Catholic anyway and so it was cultural and it was customary and so uh, people would be um, walking down the street and then they would hear bells ringing and everyone would move to the side because a priest with vestments on would be coming and carrying the Blessed Sacrament to take to somebody who was sick uh, in need of perhaps um, um, to receive communion or the what they called it the last rites in those days uh, um, and so what would happen is people would kneel and so the sister would say children let's kneel because this Jesus is coming and, and he is the king and uh, Pierre Giorgio, who was probably about four years old at the time, said, yes, he is the king of kings. And his, somebody remembered this, and it was uh, also recorded. You cannot believe how much has been written, recollections and anecdotes, all of these things uh, related to Pierre Giorgio. So it goes on and on, things like that. There was another time where a uh, uh, Corpus Christi procession was going through the streets, and people were all, all along the the side of the streets and throwing flowers and children would come prepared for this to throw flowers well the Frasati children weren't given flowers because you know their parents didn't think of such things like this and so here they are watching this and uh, young Pierre Giorgio realizes that this is Jesus coming he has a real sense of the presence in the Eucharist right even at a very young age and so he reaches into the pocket of a relative and pulls out a very nice gold pen and throws it and says here Jesus this is for you okay so he had a real sense of of how important that was this picture here when he was 16 years old so he's growing up and uh, very a very spiritual young man and his friends kind of put up with him. Sometimes they make fun of him because he's always singing and evidently he had a terrible voice. But he's growing up and looking very handsome and everything and very athletic. He loved the outdoors. He loved to mountain climb and go on hikes. And they will say things. There's a lot a lots written about him. After he died, you know, people just came from everywhere saying, oh, the, the memories they had of him and all this would start to get written down and then of course everything that he wrote that nobody knew about until after he died but look here um, he was a bit of a partier however no one ever saw him drunk nobody ever saw him take a second glass of wine one glass of wine seemed to be his limit he was very much in control of himself in that respect nobody ever heard him say a curse word and um, 
Yeah, lots of things. How many of you have never said a curse word? Go ahead, raise your hand. Come on, Ben, raise your hand. No, okay. Um, yeah, this, this picture, I like this picture. We've used this picture before for our own men's group. Here he is with a group of men. It looks like there's a priest there. And he was, he became part of all kinds of organizations. There's like 15 different organizations that he actually joined and belonged to, the St. Vincent de Paul Society and um, all kinds of Marian rosary type societies. It's all, you'll see that if you uh, read one of these books. I can't remember them all off the top of my head, but great stuff. Um, he did seem to smoke a cigar every once in a while or a pipe, which kind of cracks me up because if you watch, uh, like if you're watching any, any movies nowadays, if somebody is smoking a cigarette in the movie, it's, it's, you're warned at the beginning. Smoking. There is smoking in this movie. Well, back in those days, everybody smoked, you know, and so he didn't smoke that much, evidently. So he, must, he was probably old enough to smoke by the time that picture was taken. And then, of course, one of my favorite pictures, I went through a pipe smoking phase myself, you know. And, and back then, um, <laughs> I remember seeing this picture for the first time going, oh, I found my saint, look at this, you know, because I had this real devotion to J.R.R. Tolkien up to that point. And uh, so Pierre Giorgio kind of took over. Uh, for J.R.R. Tolkien at that point when I saw this picture. And it's funny, this picture here, very famous picture. You see this on t-shirts, you see this on posters, you see this everywhere. And once in a while, you will see that somebody has photoshopped, can we use that word, somebody has edited out the pipe. <laughs> and uh, to show him being a tobacco-free Pierre Giorgio. So that's kind of cool too, you know, because he's all things to all people, evidently. And uh, I really like this I really like this picture. He is descending Mon... Mon... Volo. I think Mon Volo. He's coming down from the mountain. And um, he's got his staff and his hiking boots. Um, so anyway, when I first saw this picture, I was living in New Zealand, right? And it was 2008. How many of you remember 2008? How many of you remember World Youth Day 2008? Where was it? Australia. Australia, okay. Sydney, Australia. And in New Zealand, we were gearing up for this. I wasn't going to go. I was much too old for such things, right? But uh, our parish was participating in something called Days in the Diocese, and so we were hosting a group of young people from the United States who were going to come and stay with us for a few days before going to uh, World Youth Day with Pope Benedict in Sydney, Australia. Well, this picture was everywhere, and these young people show up, these Americans, and they were all like, Blessed Pierre Giorgio Frassati, pray for us all the time. You know, I'm, who is this Pierre Giorgio Frassati? that they're talking about. And so that's when I b got very interested and I learned that uh, Pope John Paul II, when he started World Youth Day, he um, named some saints to be the patrons of World Youth Day. And one was Saint Therese of Lisieux, right? And another one was, was uh, Blessed Pierre Giorgio Frassati by the time I'd heard him. I don't know if he did that right at the beginning or not. But anyway, you get the idea, right? Uh, for Sydney, Australia, one of them was St. Mary MacKillop, who's an Australian saint. And she was newly, beatif newly canonized at the time. Very exciting. Since she was foundress of the Josephites, and I had several Josephite teachers when I was in New Zealand working on my religious studies. Now, uh, Pierre Giorgio was very involved in a lot of community, acti community activities. And like I said, he was uh, members of different associations like St. Vincent de Paul. Here, as far as I can tell, they're pulling this wagon. And it was, probably had some supplies for some kind of a community event or else they were taking it to feed the hungry or something like that. Uh, because there are references to him getting people to help do a lot of these things. And 
he just had a lot of fun wherever he went. And there are stories told about how he would say, he would, he would show up for a party or he would meet up some of his friends and he would say, I'll tell you what, guys, let's play some pool here. And if, uh, if you win, I'll give you some money. But if you win, you'll come with me to the holy hour at the cathedral. Mm -hmm. And of course, he was very good and he would win. So they would go to the holy hour and... Uh, it might be a group of young people like this. They would go through the streets, you know, chasing each other and making all kinds of noise and like young people do, having a great time. And they would go, as soon as they walked into the church, uh, they'd get all quiet, you know, because that's what you do. And they'd all find a place to kneel. And Pierre Giorgio would hand out prayer books and rosaries and he would get them all started. And then he would go up to the front and kneel at the communion rail and just adore Jesus. And they say that he would do this, you know, he would like be in a trance. And there's one story told about how uh, he was there praying and wax was dripping from a candle onto him and it's as if he didn't even know it. The priest went over to move this, this candle away and at the end of the hour, he would get up and gather up all of his friends and they would all go running and hollering and having a great time on their way back home. And he would do this time and time again. He would organize these trips where they would go skiing and he would plan ahead. And if there was a church in the area where they could go to mass, he would go. If there wasn't, he would use his own money to hire a priest to come along as their chaplain so that they could have mass. And there's pictures of them having mass outside. And he, um, uh, if he couldn't find a priest who would go with them and there was no mass available, he wouldn't go on the trip. They'd go without him. Another thing that they say is on the train, as they would be traveling uh, through, through the night to go to their destination, if mass was going to be the next day, the next morning, well, they would be passing out snacks and having drinks and things, and he wouldn't, he would say, oh, no, thank you. He would say, no, thank you. Then the next day at Mass, he's the only one that goes forward to receive Holy Communion because in those days, uh, you had to fast 24 hours before receiving Holy Communion. How long do we fast now? An hour? Boy, we got it rough, don't we? So anyway, this just showed his devotion to the Eucharist. It was the most important thing to him. Okay, so anyway, there's lots of pictures of him as he's growing up. And here he is with some friends. He went to college, okay? His father, of course, wanted him to become uh, following his footsteps in the newspaper business. Uh, but he was not interested in that, and he really wanted to become, he, he studied mining. He wanted to study mining because that way he could work with the poor. He, was, he wanted to go to Germany or to work with Italian miners who, who had gone to Germany. He wanted to be a missionary to the Italian miners in Germany. That's what he wanted to do. But his father said, no son of mine is going to um, do that kind of work. And uh, so he, I'm not... He's, he's getting closer to, uh, to graduating from college here in this picture. But then also look at this picture here. This is his sister, Luciana and him. And she's lovely. They're both lovely. And they were very close. And she got married eventually. And as far as I can tell, okay, you see there on the left is Pier Giorgio. But uh, there she is. She's the bride. And she married this guy named Jan Goronski. He's Polish, right? Uh, he was a Polish diplomat. Now, Pierre Giorgio, he, um, he was thinking of becoming a priest at one point, you know, because of his great devotion to God. And his mother reportedly said something like, I would rather see you dead. And so he didn't want to break her heart. And so he never talked about becoming a priest again. But he, was, he did become like a... Um, uh, what do you call those uh, people who like oblates? But what kind were they? Dominicans? They call them... Um, Third order. Something like that. Third order? Yeah. And he actually, he actually took the name Brother Jerome for his charity work. 
because he was very famous. Everyone knew the Frasades. They knew his father. And he would, he would use his own money to do all this charity work and to buy food and medicine for people. And a lot of times he didn't want word to get around that this was charity from the Frasades. And so he, they'd say, who, who did this? Who is this from? And he would say, Brother Jerome. I'm Brother Jerome. And this all came out later. But uh, uh, his sis, oh, and he was in love, they think maybe, from the letters and things. It looked like he had a girlfriend. He brought her home. His parents were very nice to her and everything. But then after she left, they said, no way, you're not going to marry her. She's too poor. <laughs> Once again, he didn't want to break his parents' heart. And uh, he was just kind of stuck. What was he going to do next? So anyway... Um, but a lot was going on. So his sister gets married. This is in 1925, actually. What year, uh, how, what year did Pierre Giorgio die? 1925. Right. And uh, like in November, right? July. July? July. Oh, that's right, on Father Tim's birthday. Yeah. Well, actually, Father Tim was born on the anniversary of, the, of Blessed Pierre Giorgio's death. Also, you know, the 4th of July thing. Um, uh, we have barbecues and stuff on that day. But his sister met this guy, Jan, in Berlin. Because remember, her father was the ambassador, so they were in Berlin a lot. And uh, Pierre Giorgio actually got involved in a lot of politics and stuff. Uh, he was a bit of an activist. And he actually got in a few fist fights and stuff, you know. His sister doesn't want you to think that he was all like, oh, and walked around with a halo and everything. But... Um, he really fought for what he believed in and um, so his sister meets this guy and they get married here in it was it was like in April of 19 in 1925 and he's Polish right he's a diplomat from Poland now I want you to picture this there is a very strong connection now between the Frasades and Poland. The Frasades, they're Italian, and they have this connection with Poland. Okay, now, shortly after this time uh, where Luciana got married, uh, Pier Giorgio is going on a climb. He does this a lot. This is probably the most famous picture of him. They, there are so many pictures of this guy. There are there's hardly any pictures of anybody born in 1901, right? My grandpa, I have like pictures of him when he was quite old, but I have one picture of him at Fort Sill when he was a, a soldier, and which is kind of special to me because I was a soldier at Fort Sill too. But there's hardly any pictures of my grandpa. There are so many pictures of Pierre Giorgio, right? Their, their family was rich, and they had cameras, and probably photographers followed them around or something. But here he is, and one of the most famous pictures of him, he is climbing up this mountain here. Yeah, it looks like it. I don't know. Um, I don't know what's in outside the borders of the picture, but this is a very famous picture. And this, it says on this picture, Verso Lato, which is generally translated to the heights or to the top. And some people say onward and upward, you know. Uh, and this has kind of become like a theme for, for um, Pierre Georgian spirituality, I guess. And uh, he actually wrote this on the back side of the picture, but somehow or other somebody decided... Let's put it on the front so people can see. So that's a neat trick, but it is his, a facsimile of his handwriting, and he did p write it on that picture. This picture was given to uh, a friend of his who was with him on this climb. It is, the last, it is the last climb he would ever go on. Okay, so what uh, Pierre Giorgio did, you know, is he would use his own money, from the time he was a little boy, he would, he would take his pocket money and he would buy, he'd go and buy to the bakery and buy the old bread, the old bread. And then he'd go around the poor neighborhood and give bread to the children. And um, this just became a regular thing with him. And so as he grew older, he 
continue to do this kind of thing. Uh, he would borrow money. He al- if he ran out of money, he would borrow money, maybe from his sister. But he kept a ledger of all the money he borrowed, how much he owed to different people. So when he got money, he paid her back. But he also showed what he used the money to buy for. Everything he did, he didn't share it with anybody. Nobody knew about it. But he was very meticulous about it because I think uh, for him it was like stewardship. He felt really responsible to do the best he can to minister to the needs of these poor people and sick people. And so he uh, would use his own money, buy food and medicine for people, and he did this as he got older and older. When he turned 18, he rode his bicycle everywhere. When he turned 18, his uh, dad gave him a car. The same day, he sells the car, and he gives half of the money to St. Vincent de Paul, and the other half he uses, it's all in this book, he uses to buy medicine and food and go as Brother Jerome to share this with people. Well, uh, I mean, there's a lot more. We could go on and on and on. But to make a long story short, um, in ministering to these sick people, you know, he lives through the Spanish flu and everything. Uh, his his uh, military service, which was um, compulsory for young men in Italy in those days, it was deferred because he was a college student but in all of his writings you know he talked about how once he's done with college he's going to do his military service and then he wants to go work in the mines and all this kind of all this is written out Uh, but um, he would always continue to help the sick and things so well what happened anyway at some point he contracted polio and this very aggressive form of polio and from ministering to sick people. And he was feeling, you know, as you can imagine, very bad. In fact, they say he never complained of sickness or pain or anything. For the first time ever, he asked one of the maids if he could have an aspirin. It's the only time he ever asked for any medicine for himself, and it seems that he must have been in terrible pain. His sister said that as he went down the hallway to view the body, to visit the body of their grandmother who just died, he stumbled like three times. He, this is how much pain he was in. He was in so much pain that he couldn't sleep in his bed. He slept on, I think he slept on the pool table. But nobody knew this because grandma was dying, right? And so they're all fussing about grandma. She's near the end of her life. He loved his grandmother and everything, uh, but she's dying. And um, she does. She dies. In the meantime, Pierre Giorgio is so sick that nobody knows him because of all the arrangements they're making for the grandmother. By the time they realize that he is in danger of dying himself, he's so sick it's really too late and they try you know to get uh some medicine to come in on uh, but this there's a snowstorm and they can't get medicine to come from france or somewhere that perhaps some experimental vaccine for this they had in in italy they had no medicine for this but be but pierre giorgio says this is the last thing he wrote here can you read that uh of course not it's in italian right he, he said to his sister, go, go, to, uh, go to my coat and take out of the pocket. Uh, there's some medicine for the poor man. Um, the poor man. Um, anyway, some poor guy, right? He's very sick. And I forgot, I've got his injections here. And then there's this ticket here. You need to go and... Uh, tell him I will cover the expense of this or whatever. The last thing he thought and wrote was an act of love and caring for somebody who was sick, somebody that he had made a promise to he felt responsible for. So this here is a real um, important relic. It's the last thing he wrote, and then he died. Okay, so his family is a little shocked that their son got so sick and died. And, you know, they didn't. (laughs) 
So they didn't see it coming. But, uh, you know, you got to you do what you got to do. Uh, they're going to bury him in a couple of days. They have a family um, uh, cemetery, mausoleum, uh, where all the Frasati dead are interred. And it's actually up, um, up there, uh, where, near their summer home. So they're going to have a funeral in their little church there in Turin. Not at the cathedral, but they're in the church. And what they didn't realize was, <laughs> look, this is um, a picture of all the people that showed up. As soon, it didn't take long. Word spread that he died. Brother Jerome died. Pierre Giorgio has died. Thousands and thousands of people showed up. His parents were astonished. They had no idea that he even knew this many people. And then the story started to circulate about, uh, you know, everything that he'd done for them. You see uh, right there, this fellow with the military uniform, that's his best friend. And there's a lot of letters written back and forth between him. He was doing his military service in the Air Force. And so here he comes to his friend's funeral. Okay, now this is the way things worked in Italy. Father Tim and I were talking the other day about how many saints there are in Italy, you know. Uh, they just have so many saints. And you can't swing a cat without hitting a saint somewhere in Italy, right? And just about every church has got some dead person under glass that you can come and venerate. That's kind of cool, really. Um, but what happened was all the stories started coming out and people started talking about Piero Giorgio and it just spread all through Turin, the region, and all through Italy. And then, you know, people started demanding sainthood, sainthood for Piero Giorgio. And so this spread and spread. Uh, and at the time, uh, the Pope was uh, Pius Twelfth, right? Okay, and uh, 19 the 1920s. Uh, a cause isn't open until five years, generally, until five years after you die, right? So Fred, five years after you're gone, we will open the cause. But they don't do it right away because, you know, things got to calm down. People have to collect their thoughts, you know, and then people start talking. Well, this was growing with fervor. So, after five years, Pius XII opens up the cause because it seems like there's a demand for it. You know, there seems to be a cause. So, when they open the cause, they start collecting testimonies, anything the guy ever wrote, and so they were in the process of doing this. Okay, we're talking about interwar Europe here, right? So, who's in charge of Italy now? Mussolini, Mussolini right? Uh, you know, you remember Mussolini. He's a, remember your grandpa used to throw uh, gasoline on the burning barrel and you'd hear him yell, burn Mussolini, burn! Yeah, it's that guy, right? And so uh, this, he was in charge of Italy and Mr. Frassati, the ambassador, is outspoken. He's got this newspaper. He's outspoken against fascism, against Mussolini. He ends up uh, having to resign, being the ambassador to Berlin. He also uh, loses the newspaper. And, and Mussolini and them, this is, this is just amazing, all the politics involved here. Mussolini and them, they start these stories about Frassati. You know, they want to shut down this cause for sainthood for him. And they start telling lies about him, how he was just a real... Um, ladies man and having sex with all these girls and not only that they said uh, his parents were ashamed of the fact that he was sick and became a crippled and so they actually buried him alive and they dug him up and they could see that he was pulling out his hair because he was in so much pain and anguish in the casket and of course these were all lies now so what happened was the church actually shut down the cause you know, work on the cause. It was just too much friction going on politically in Italy at the time. And so they just closed the books on it and walked away from it. And years later, uh, 
Pope Paul VI is the Pope now, and he's an Italian, and he remembers uh, when he was a young priest, he actually became a member of one of the groups that Frassati was part of at, at the university when he was a student. And so he knows about this great devotion to Frassati that's growing up amongst the young people, and he becomes Pope, and he goes, whatever happened to the cause for Frassati? And uh, Mussolini by then, you know, has been uh, dealt with, right? Okay, so this is post-war Europe now. And, and Paul VI is like, what, you guys get busy, open the cause for Frassati again and get busy on it. Well, there was still, can you imagine this, in the Curia, as they used to call it, uh, there was still... Um, political pressure and, and clerics who um, would um, not deal with certain things because of pressures that were put on them or whatever. And so after something like five or six years go by, and finally Paul VI says, where, is, where are we at with the cause for Frasati? And they go, ah, that, 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 that. And he says, bring it to me. I want it on my desk. And they brought it to him and, uh, on his desk, and he signed it, had it opened up, and he said, get busy. And so they got busy. And what happens when you get busy on this and you start to um, do all these things, they investigate, you know, it's quite a lot what they go into. They read every single thing you ever wrote. They find every testimony they can get by people who knew you. And it's very, it, it's very, very um, deep, this research that they do. And, you know, they have a guy whose job is to try to find something wrong you know, is there any truth to these lies that Mussolini and them were telling? And so they're trying to do all this. And it's, it's becoming evident that this guy really was a saint. So at some point, you have to, um, you have to, um, well, like I said, read everything you wrote. Look, here is a, a, this is a manuscript. It's what it is. Can you tell? Can you see that? It is uh, the 13th chapter of 1 Corinthians, you know. Um, if I speak with the tongue of men and angels, but I don't have love, you know, I'm, I'm just a sounding brass, right? Um, it, it's uh, the love, the great love chapter. And he kept this with him always, and he'd copy it out, and he would hand it to people because this was uh, uh, one of the guiding principles of his life. Paul's 13th chapter of of 1 Corinthians. And uh, remember I said there was this great connection between Italy, the Frasades, and Poland. Oh, let me mention this too. Even though uh, Mr. Frasati lost the newspaper and everything, he actually, the first miracle, the first miracle is uh, they became devout Catholics they, they were reconciled to the church, and they, they were about to get a divorce, which was very uncommon in those days in Italy to get a divorce. And Mr. and Mrs. Frassati, they were going to split up, and Pierre Giorgio knew this. In fact, uh, he said to his friend when he went on that climb, you know, the Verso Lato climb, he said, he said, I would gladly give my life to keep my parents from splitting up. And so that was one of the last things that he was praying for. And after his death and the great witness of all these people who came to the funeral, uh, this touched them. And the, so the first real miracle is their marriage was saved and they came back to Holy Mother Church, you know, and they were reconciled and they spent the rest of their lives also promoting the message and spreading the gospel uh, that Pierre Giorgio had spread. And so it spread all across Europe. And during, a World, War, during World War II, um, the, the Frassades, they did a lot of work, a lot of underground work, a lot of rescue type work. And, you know, of course, in Poland, uh, the Nazis occupied all of Poland. And, of course, the fascists were in power in Italy. And so it was, um, it was very dangerous work they were doing, but they were doing a lot of good work. And there was a young priest in Poland who 
um, was also an outdoorsy guy. He loved to ski and go on hikes and stuff. And he heard, of course, he heard about Frasati, and he became like a hero to him. So this guy here, you recognize him, the one there on the left on skis. And here he is again, going out for a hike. And here he is, just like Frasati, he'd take these, he'd have the group of young people out, and then they would talk about very deep, meaningful things. And he would pass out prayer books and say, hey, let's say pra our prayers, or let's uh, read the Psalms, right? So this guy, Carol Waitola, he ends up becoming the uh, Cardinal Archbishop of Krakow, right? And he remembers how Pierre Giorgio was a great inspiration to him when he was uh, a young priest living under communist oppression in Eastern Europe. And so he becomes the Pope, wouldn't you know it? And here he is all in white. And as the, uh, as the cause progresses, and they know everything they know about Pierre Giorgio Frassati, at some point, what they have to do is uh, find out where the guy is buried. And of course, they knew where he was buried. He was buried in uh, the family crypt, right? And they, uh, so they go and exhume him. And um, this is in 1981. Right? In 1981, they go and they take uh, his coffin out of the grave, and Luciana and her kids are there. 1981, okay, Luciana was born in uh, 1903, and this is 1981. So she's getting along in years, you know, but she's doing really well. And they all go, they go, where are we going, Mama? Well, we're going to dig up Uncle Pierre Giorgio. Because this is part what you do when there's a cause for sainthood, right? And so how long has this guy been in the grave, right? Well, they got it. the reason they dig him up is because they take him to a place where pilgrims can come, you know, uh, to visit him. Because that's how certain they are that this guy is a saint. And so they uh, dig him up. And honest, this is the picture of him. I, did, I, there is, I don't know that there's a picture of him uh, when he was dead, before they buried him. This is a picture of him after they dig him up. And, and, they, and they say that, um, you know, it, it looked just like he was sleeping. Luciana, if you read her book, she says, and I just wanted to say, wake up, Pierre Giorgio, wake up. And uh, everything else, like his clothes were starting to fall apart and uh, the, the rosary was all rusting and the wooden parts of it were all decaying. But look at him, and um, so they described him as perfectly incorrupt. Well, in a great Italian fashion, what they decide to do then is take him all over Italy to all the places he's been and say, hey, anybody remember Pierre Giorgio? Here he is! And so they took him all over the place before they put him uh, into uh, his own tomb in in uh, the cathedral of St. John the Baptist in Turin. So, uh, and here's that grave. This is in Turin. You can go and visit it. But the thing is, in uh, 1980, not 1980, what am I saying? T 2008. In 2008, I'm in New Zealand, like I told you about, right? And uh, uh, Benedetto says uh, he's going to World Youth Day in Sydney, and he says, I want Pierre and Giorgio to go with me. And so they, they don't take him. They, they do. They take in a reliquary, right? A great big coffin kind of thing. They don't open him up in Sydney. Uh, they say since then, since ever all those Italians had a look at him, he's actually starting to fall apart. So they... Um, kept the lid on him as they took him to uh, World Youth. They t also took St. Therese, too, um, to Sydney. So this is a kind of cool thing. How many of you have relics in your home? Dead people or pieces of dead people? I have my kids' teeth, all of their baby teeth, and, and clippings from their hair. It's kind of the same sort of thing. you know. It, maybe not exactly. Um, yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. 
Meaningful memories. Well, you know, uh, we've been doing this, this relic thing in the church. We've been doing this for a long time. And, uh, you know, the Pantheon where they killed all kinds of Christians. Uh, well, no, they killed all the Christians over in the Colosseum, right? Well, then after the Christians took over the Pantheon, which was this big temple to all the gods. That's what Pantheon means, all the gods. The, the Pope had all the bones not all of them, but a lot of the bones that were down in the catechism, he uh, had them carted over. It's like 500 cartloads of Christian bones, and they buried them under the altar of the Christian recommissioned church, the church of uh, Mary, Mother of God, and the Holy Martyrs, which used to be the Pantheon. Yes, tourists, they still say, this is the Pantheon. Well, you go in there, it's a Catholic church is what it is, and all those Christian martyrs are buried under there and so every it's just like the church is built on the bones and the martyrs anyway anyway it's a big deal these bones but Pierre Giorgio there's no pieces of his body you know like uh, people don't have because those old what would they would do was with the saint by the time they get around to needing a relic because they have like the warehouses full of pieces of of saints uh, what they would do is, you know, they're nice and dried out and everything, and they just snap off a finger, you know, and then cut it into little pieces and send them off. And so, like, in our altar here, we got bones under the altar here, and in the chapel, if you pull back the cover, there's a piece of somebody's bone there. And I'll show you if you want to see it. But um, Pierre Giorgio, they didn't do that, because look at him. He looked like he was sleeping. They weren't going to snap off a finger, were they? So there are no uh, first-class relics. Evidently, this is what I'm told. But anyway, so that was in 1981 when they dug him up. And then uh, he's been all over the place uh, since 1990 when he was beatified. Look at all the people that showed up for his beatification. And Pope John Paul II said, Pierre Giorgio did all the stuff, all, all of this heroic, virtuous stuff. He did it without telling anybody. He did it without asking for recognition. He did it because it was the right thing to do. And so, even though usually when we have a canonization or uh, a beatification service, we do a whole bunch of them because, you know, it costs a lot of money. The catering alone costs a fortune, right? So they try to do a whole bunch. Well, with Blessed Pierre Giorgio Fressati, when he was beatified, it was just him. So you only see one banner there. One, uh, oftentimes there's several banners. So, um, and there's Pope John Paul II. You can see him there. Okay, now this here, uh, in closing up here, here is uh, Luciana. And she, uh, I thought this was kind of interesting. Uh, she lived, you know how old she lived to be? 105. So Pierre Giorgio lives to be 24, and his sister lives to be 105. And she spent, you know, most of those 105 years um, telling the story of Pierre Giorgio. In fact, she, uh, when the cause for his sainthood was closed down, she went to Rome, and and she she didn't care if he was beatified. She didn't care about the cause. She went to clear his name. She said, these are lies and I'm going to prove it. And she got affidavits and all kinds of stuff. His grave had, was never opened. They were saying it had been opened and it, there was evidence that he was buried alive. And so she really worked hard to get all of this proof anyway. And she was a great writer. She wrote a lot of stuff. But she was very busy, 105 years old. I got a feeling, you know, um, it had something to do with, with God averaging out the years between these two very close brother and sister. And uh, so that's pretty good between the two of them. Read the, get this book and read it if you can.